So welcome to the next episode um, about copyright and licenses. This time I thought we'd talk a bit about open projects. So this is about the, uh, the fact that an open project isn't only about open source. Uh, it's also about the project itself. How is it governed? Um, but it, it could also be in the other direction. It could only be an open core. So, so even only parts of the source being available. Um, so I've had a look at this from, from some various aspects. And, uh, and the first one thing, the technical thing that everyone thinks about is the source code. Is all of it available or not? Uh, another aspect is, is, do you share your bugs and issues? It, can, can you go to the project and see what bugs there are? Uh, what's open, the discussion around the bugs and so on. Um, another one is the planning or the road mapping. So is, is it an open discussion where we're heading or, or is it something that only a group in the project can actually look into? Um, and, and the governance is, is like the ultimate one. So, so who is the, the dictator for life, so to speak? Or is there a, a team running the the project that you can join or or is it a company that owns it so you need to be employed by it to, to sort of have influence in there so so these are aspects more than outside of the source so to speak um and then i tried to create a scale and and, and it's hard because these are all different dimensions so the, mm -hmm. there are projects that don't really fulfill this scale but i i think the picture illustrates it with the with the source code diminishing as the the open core model comes in, um, and and then you have the full fledged where everyone can join the governance, the planning, the bugs are public, the source code is public, um, and and just ah, to, so so it's like a scale from from left to right here. Kind of the thing is that there are things that sort of don't check all the boxes, so it's a, I try to make it a scale, but it, it's not necessarily a scale. Um, okay. and then I had to look at some projects, and of course, I picked projects that make it look like a scale. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I mean, if you, if you look at the uh, the first one, the, the Linux kernel, then that, that's complete anarchy in in a good form so to speak the source code is fully available all the bugs and issues are openly discussed the the planning is openly discussed and the governance is completely open it, anyone can sort of create their own fork and and the governance is open in the, in the manner that there is no sort of government governance around it so uh, you mean that anyone can file a like a, a contribution a patch and get it into the kernel <laughs> Well, if you pass Linus, <laughs> but but anyone can sort of have their own uh, kernel tree as well. It's I mean there are multiple kernels even though Linus heads the mainline without forking. So it's I, and I say you can have you can definitely join the discussions around it. So I would call it very open. I agree. Good. <laughs> so then, looking at the the other end of the scale, uh, you you have something like Android. Where, where you have an open source uh, and you have the, the Android open source project, but it's open core because the Google services are, are still proprietary and something that you cannot get access to. The planning and road mapping is, is very close down and you don't even see the intermediate development steps in some cases, but, but you get these releases if it every quarter, every six months. Um, and the govern, governance and bug tracking and all of it is sort of internal Google tools that are only available to select suppliers. Is, it, is this true for all of Android, or is it like, uh, I mean, if you look at only the Android open source project, would this still apply, or would you, would you have moved uh, the icon more to the left then, or is that also then just open source? Open or? source? I'm not sure if you can find all the bug trackers and so on on the open source project page i'd have to check that but i mean the yeah. planning and governance and and to some extent the the development deltas are still kept oh, it's still the same okay. on the inside yeah. so to speak just to make matters worse i mean from my experience every mobile vendor has their own version and tree with with exactly the same or even worse uh, from an open perspective yeah exactly with their bsps and, and add-ons and yeah whatnot yeah yeah at, at least there are publishing it the uh, via Git, although a bit late perhaps, but 
at least it's in Git or it's version controlled, so you don't get a tar zip or something. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they they work as an open source project for parts of it, uh, but it's only an open source project. It's not an open project, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And and then I've seen a, a, a Swedish consulting company that was procured by uh, actually your hometown, you want Alling Source, uh, and. It was supposed to be an open source project, and at the end of the project, they uploaded a zip file at SourceForge, and we're done. <laughs> Technically, you do fulfill it, but yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. So that's open source, but it's not an open project. Yeah, and technically, it would already be open source if you only deliver the source to the user. Absolutely, and yeah. I, I think that's a relevant and important distinction to make. So thanks. Yeah, and I, I think on on this scale, everything is open source, and everyone plays by the rules. It's it's just a scale in in how open you are, so to speak. So it's, mm -hmm. and I, I even go so far as to say that having an open project and opening all of this is not implied by calling yourself open source or free software. It's uh, it's just that you can do this from different dimensions. So there is no right and wrong in this scale. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but. Um, I suppose the strength in in uh, releasing the software as open source or free software is that if people are dissatisfied with the way the governments are planning are done, it's always possible to fork and create a, a separate community for, well, whichever project. Yeah, and th that you see around. I mean, Android has all the, the open source variants. Um, I can't recall a name of one of the, the the alternative OSS, but there are a number of spins that has like alternative implementations of the Google services and linear OS or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, and the Xiamen uh, guys, or is that the same? Maybe I'm not sure. Yep. I'm not sure either. But there, there are some variants out there. Uh, another project that's interesting is is uh, the GCC project because I, I sort of put that in the middle of the scale. So, so having looked at it, I mean, the source code is fully available, the bugs and issues are available, but the planning is sort of handled by a governance team, and the governance team is composed by important stakeholders. And at least to me, it wasn't completely transparent in how you get yourself onto that board, which means that it, I would say that it's less open because it's it's harder to influence the direction of it. I mean, looking at Linux, it feels like the, there you go only on the engineering merit. They don't really care what you change. Here you have a planning board that, that sort of sets the direction and, and sort of validates it from that perspective. And then looking further, we, we have something like GitLab, uh, which is another version of an open core project uh, where they share their bugs and issues. Uh, but of course, being open core, they also govern the planning and so on as a as a company and make sure that the open versions and the corporate or commercial versions still differentiate somehow so that they can get paying customers to pay for the development of all of it. Uh, and then, then we have a mover, uh, QT, uh, which is kind of interesting because they started outside open source at all and had their QPL license, which wasn't really open source. And then they gradually moved in sort of an open core GPL direction. Um, and then in the whole turmoil, so it was originally developed by a company called Trolltech that was acquired by Nokia. And then when Nokia changed to uh, to Windows Phone in the whole ELOP happening, uh, the engineering team and the organization around Qt tried to save it by creating the Qt project that has an open governance around Qt. Um, and I mean, the maintainer role of a Qt model is module is not tied to being employed by the Qt company, which is the current copyright holder. It's more of a well, it's an it's an open governance model around it that's clearly defined in how you get to different roles and so on. Um, so, so they've made a journey, um, and they're still moving. I mean, it, it, they are now experimenting with the market and moving perhaps towards an open core model. I would say again, uh, with certain add-on modules being uh, being commercial only. But uh, yeah, it, it's interesting that this scale isn't fixed. Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could be you could be a company that uses the open core model, and for the 
for the core part of things, you would be all the way to the left. Whereas on the on the add-on part, you would you wouldn't even be it wouldn't be even be source available. Exactly. Yeah, and if you look at the Qt company, I mean, I worked at the, as a commercial customer to them and, and paid for support. And then, of course, there is an extended bug tracker with the support tickets for the commercial customers that has a guaranteed response time and so on. So it's, mm -hmm. it's two slightly different worlds. But it's interesting to view it this way, because if you go for something like Android, you're really then you need to be able to maintain it yourself because you don't control the direction of it. You, you don't do it in, in, in any of these perspectives because it's a bigger community, but then someone else clearly has control over it. While for for Linux, it's really a controlled chaos. Nobody directs the projects <laughs> and, and then everyone does it. Uh, so, so you're less likely to sort of be overrun by the, the main project. But there's actually a completely different perspective to this. So now we've talked about different levels of openness and that you can open up more. Uh, but there is also a number of contradictions uh, to this, which I find very interesting. And one of them is uh, responsible disclosure. Uh, so I spoke a bit to Daniel Steinbeck around curl. Uh, so curl is a, is a network tool, and it's exposed to internet in some scenarios. So, so they have a way to handle security issues that allows people to patch problems before they are disclosed. So, so this is really a, a, a subset of the people, a trusted subset of the people involved in the project get these bugs report and can fix them before it's disclosed to a broader community. Um, there's also a place called uh, Open Wall where distributions can participate and, and sort of get a heads up that this patch is important to get in because the CVE or the bug will be announced later on so that you might be abused um, if you don't integrate it. Um, so it's an interesting side track. So you protect the users by not di disclosing everything to the users. Um, the, there are other aspects to this. Uh, like trademarks. So, so we've spoken about patents and stuff. Uh, trademarks is, is a different thing. So, so you can restrict who can reuse the name of your project. So it's fully open source and everyone can fork it and do whatever they like, but you protect the brand. So examples of this is uh, Ardenio, Mozilla, Firefox, and so on. So, so it really controls legally who can create an official configuration. Um, while not restricting the other freedoms that, that you have in uh, from the open source definition or the free software definition. Um, oh, yeah. so, so I've found an example of this. So for instance, the, you could for a short while buy LibreOffice through the Windows App Store. Uh, and this could then be stopped by them having the trademarks. It cannot be called LibreOffice and you can't use that icon. N nobody prevents you from repackaging the code as a as a paid offering, but they can stop you from using the brand. Mm. But that, that's not because of the license, that's just because they protect the, the brand. It's like a separate uh, legal branch. Exactly. And I guess it would be harder to do so without having done so. It, it makes things a lot clearer when you when you try to get this taken down from the App Store if you own the, the copyright or the, the trademark. But that has implications on on uh, distributions like Debian, for example, I remember for quite a long time they refused to pull in the Firefox logo into it. Uh, because, it, it wasn't um, that they were re refused; it was that uh, they weren't allowed to repackage it as as Firefox because Debian added uh, extra patches. I think was the thing. Ah, so because then they, they had ice v weasel for a while, didn't they? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so that was their, their workaround for it. But uh, so, so you mean that they, they because of the patches, it was a different thing. And then uh, Mozilla told them you cannot just change our thing and then deliver it changed because we exactly will, uh, you can't call it Firefox when you do that much changes. I think so. This is available somewhere on the Debian wiki. Uh, we'll make sure to check it out before we publish this. Yeah, definitely. Or we find someone from Debian and ask them things about it. <laughs> or 
Mozilla. Or Mozilla. Yeah. Or both, and we make them fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I thought about one thing. You mentioned Kerr before. We haven't bashed Daniel, who is the author, yet. So we need to do that on a regular basis. We've done it in other podcasts. So let's do that. Daniel, why did you create your own license? I mean, that, that should really be a summer special episode. We, we should make sure to do that when he's nice and relaxed. Yeah. We should have a, a custom license discussion with, with one of those, the people who failed to read the memo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, isn't there any project that takes trademark the other way around, saying that you can't rename it? That I don't know. And can you actually do that? Is, do you fulfill the... The freedoms then. Then you restrict what you change. Yeah. Hmm. Under the distribution. Wow. We need a new lawyer. <laughs> yeah, we need to find someone. Yeah. <laughs> no, but so that, are you, for trick. example, allowed to uh, take the Google code and, oh, sorry, the Android code and, and call it like Zebra <laughs> or whatever? Yes. And that that's done by, but Linear OS, isn't it? That's basically Android oh, okay. repackaged and added some more stuff to it. It's called Lineage OS, right? Line. Ah, okay. I think Linaro is a is a Linux consulting company. We're embedded ah, okay. guys. Yeah, I am confusing all of those. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the only one confused. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Am so I confused? No, so you're confusing. Uh -huh. <laughs> There is slightly more of the contradictions here. Um, I We discussed patents. So, I mean, you can check out our old episodes with Mirko around that. Uh, but there's also things like export restrictions, uh, which used to be a thing at least in the late 90s and early 2000s. I, I think it's calmed down a bit. Uh, it's still a thing very much regarding Google versus Huawei. Ah, interesting. Then we need are, yeah, I mean, Huawei are creating their own Google services because... Uh, they are not allowed to use Google services for new products, I think. Yeah, but that's the Google services. So that's the commercial offering. But earlier, there ah, were yeah. like encryption algorithms and stuff that you couldn't export to certain countries. I think that is still a thing, except, I don't know. I mean, yeah. it, it, legally, it's still a thing in some places. It's just that people don't care. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how it works. I think that's still a thing in Sweden, for example. If you want to export something that could be like uh, defense-style uh, material, you have to go through a special board or something. Cool. Yeah, we need to find a lawyer there, definitely. And we've already found a lawyer to, to discuss the third point, so that's coming up. So discussion around contributors' license agreement, uh, which is something that, for instance, QT are using to... Uh, to enable their business model where they relicense the code commercially with support, or you can use it as open source on the GPL. Um, so it's it's not a restriction for the end user, it's a restriction for when you want to contribute things in sort of the, the mainline branch. Um, but apart from that, that's the, the end of sort of this openness and closeness, <laughs> closedness. Uh, <laughs> Um, look at various projects. So, yeah, we'll see you around for another episode, another week. See ya. Okay, cheers. <laughs>